Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. As always, I'm going to go grab my coffee. A very exciting week for you. I think this whole class has been exciting in terms of these disasters, and I'll say my, my usual bit. Um, but indeed, this is totally true. Like, God rest their souls. All these people that die, I think that the great benefit of these talks are this class is as we cover each disaster, right? Like you're made aware of it and you're also made aware of like, well, pray for these people. They could be in purgatory. They could need our prayers. Hello. You can take the TV. Yeah, 100%. Guys, you're making a guest appearance live on Maple Syrup Street. Hello. There's 21,216 people watching. Um, You guys can take the TV forever. Yeah. Uh, I don't need a TV. I have a computer, right? <laughs> Who needs, who needs a double? I mean, this There's is kind of 21,000 people watching this. 21,216. It's written in invisible ink, though. So <laughs> you can't see. Like, only I can see it. It's like Emperor's Clothes. It's like Emperor's yeah. Clothes. <laughs> what I was, no, what I was saying, though, for our, for our 21,262 people online, mm -hmm. is that uh, getting, um, becoming aware of the different disasters will encourage us to pray for people's souls. Uh, as long as well as like having their their story told. So what I was saying before, we have an exciting week. I think all the weeks are exciting, but this week is especially nice. I think um, in that we're talking about the tri-state tornado outbreak and the Hindenburg. And why do I say this is especially nice? Because I really feel like going off of what I talked about last class, how World War One is the kind of inauguration of the modern world, right? I really feel like um, we are now seeing like what what is the the long stretch of the times we can truly call our own post World War One. Whether you're born in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, whatever, post World War One is very very much our time. So Parker, um, I'm going to grab my coffee. We're going to get back and get to it. First of our this is the today will be our first lecture of the post World War One period, 1920s. And we don't get off that train, obviously, the rest of the class. We'll go from here to talking about Catholics, Catholicism, and COVID come semester's end. So I'll be back to you in one second. Yeah, that's right. Who is in the 60s, so he can be the 77s. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this time. Uh, this computer screen. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Yes, it's kind of where you set your thermometer. Yeah. Well, in this case, location. Oh, no, generally. No, it's great. The nearest weather station is nothing. Yeah. The temperatures are a little warm, and I think the asphalt soaked up the sun. I think you're right. Yeah. Fortunately, the clock and I had a built-in thermometer thing mm -hmm. and that gives the us extra temperature. Yeah, oh yeah. I think it's really pretty accurate. Oh, let's hope so. Yeah. If you don't have it, you're not gonna make it accurate. Well, <laughs> yeah. Good, I can get it there in fact. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Like how what are the those really under you? Yeah. yeah. All right. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Okay, so I did like kind of uh, all over the place preamble before. We had friends come get the TV. We had a bunch of stuff going on. Now to business. Our first of the rest of the semester post World War One lectures, modernity, our time. Our topic today is the 1925 tri-state tornado outbreak. 1925 tri-state tornado outbreak 
everything from now over the next hour, whatever, 50 minutes, nothing but business. It takes place between March 17th and March 19th of 1925. The greatest, strongest surge or storm surge single, so this is a, a multiple kind of cluster cell, a kind of family of tornadoes. The largest tornadoes reach the F5 registration classification, which I see from some of your faces, it's exactly my reaction to it. It's the worst, you know with winds over 300 miles per hour. March 17th through 19th in this family of tornadoes, you have as many as 12 tornadoes total. However, the number, number is still disputed today. <clears throat> Where does one tornado begin? Where does another end? You know, what's what spawns off it? 2,000 injuries, 751 fatalities, and in today's money, it would be two and a half billion dollars of damage. The tri-state tornado, now the, let's get some classification out of the way really fast. I am using synonymously the term tri-state tornado and the larger cluster. The actual tri-state tornado happens on March 18th. And of course, I'm going to get to that probably in 20 minutes or whatever. I'll get to it over the course of lecture. Well, when I say tri-state tri tornado, yes, I'm talking about that individual funnel cloud, the one on March 18th, but I really mean all three days, okay? For the purpose of this lecture, when I say tri-state tornado, I'm talking about all three days. It is the deadliest disaster in Illinois history deadliest tornado in U.S. history, and the second deadliest tornado in world history. Well, what's the deadliest? That seems to kind of beg the question, right? This Dalipatur Satoria tornado, which occurred in Bangladesh, April 26, 1989, which this is just co coincidental, is three years to the day of the Chernobyl disaster, wow. which, will which will dedicate... Um, two classes to a whole week to come November. April 26, 1989, Dalipatur Satura tornado in Bangladesh kills approximately 1,300 people. And as I was saying earlier, my favorite thing about Catholicism and disasters is bringing these disasters to light, seeing the heroism of the reaction, Catholic and non-Catholic alike, but also, oh, I, I never heard of the tri-state tornado. Now I have. I might include those people in my intentions. I'll pray for their souls. And indeed, God rest all their souls. And in Bangladesh, and all the people that we read about, a lot of death this semester in our class for obvious reasons. Dalipatur Saturia is number one, the deadliest tornado in, in world history. But two things. At the time when tri-state happens in 1925, right? owing to the fact that it's you know 64 years before, when the tri-state happens, our focus today, it's the deadliest in world history. And this latter Bangladesh tornado is still disputed today. They say 1,300. They don't know how many people were killed by the tornado or by famine and drought in the area. Did you die because of COVID or with COVID, right? That kind of thing. So it's very possible what we're talking about today. Go ahead, Brett. Now, now in Bangladesh, was that actually a tornado or were they calling that a... Not a cyclone, yeah. No, it was, it was a tornado. A tornado, yeah. Not a hurricane, not a cyclone, tornado. There's no disputation about the meteorological event. Hello, hello. Um, great to see you. Uh, talking about tri-state tornado today, deadliest tornado, arguably perhaps in world history. We're just saying this tornado in Bangladesh, 1989, might be worse, but it's it's disputed. You come at the perfect time. Have a lot of more people on the ground to get injured and killed. Indeed, indeed. So if you have two thousand people and two hundred plus deaths in a three-state area, that's pretty bad because it was all rural for most of it. So let's say that's an excellent point because of the rural nature. What are the tri-states, by the way? Missouri, Illinois, Indiana. Although there are significant tornadoes in Alabama and Kansas as well, I'm going to give you the whole dates on this. The whole facts. Dates is the wrong word. Datos in Spanish means facts. So I was thinking in Spanish. 
because I'm Colombian, guys. So, you know, um, <laughs> I would see, like, if I get to, if I get to speak fluent Spanish, it's awesome because I have blonde hair, blue eyes. And people are like, this guy's just a gringo. And then I start going full on Spanish. It's like, that's legit. You know, it's like, it's unexpected, I would say. Um, I'm going to give you all the facts, the meteorological facts, indeed. But once more, in for Vivian, what we just missed here, what you missed nothing except just quick facts that I'll recap, which I'd want to recap anyways. Tri-State Tornado, 1925, March 17th through the 19th. F5 level in some of these funnel clouds. There's, there's disputably 12 tornadoes, more or less, we don't know. Some reach F5 level, which means wind speed of 300 miles per hour, lasting at times for over seven hours. Remember the earthquakes, they're 45 seconds, 38 seconds, seven hour duration, 2,000 injuries, 751 fatalities, two and a half billion dollars of damage. And like Barb said, great point, Owing to the rural character of this area, all this kind of stuff, maybe it's the worst tornado ever. Maybe. Why not? You said it, it lasted how many hours? Some tornadoes, some funnel clouds last seven hours. Seven hours working across the plains. It's crazy. It's insane stuff. 1925. 98 years ago. That coffee's hot. My coffee's too hot. Where's the McDonald's warning? You make it burn. Everyone knows the story. The McDonald's woman sued someone because yes. the famous, like 1980s, my coffee was too hot. That, that was my sister. Um, <laughs> but it was not. I'm just kidding. Okay. Back to the tri-state tornado. The 219-mile-long track left by the tornado is across from southeastern Missouri through southern Illinois and then into southwestern Indiana is the longest tornado path ever recorded. Modern meteorolog meteorological reanalysis has suggested that the extremely long path length and lifespan reported are perhaps more plausibly attributed to multiple independent tornadoes belonging to a tornado family mm -hmm. rather than a single continuous tornado. The late winter to early spring, this is March 1925, of 1925 was warmer and drier than normal over much of the central United States. Um, so the kind of like conditions as we work into late spring are in ways far above my understanding. My meteorological understanding is I was making a joke in some previous classes about, I forget what it was, but that I have no understanding of like this subfield, oh, it was a ship, ships, talking about the Titanic. I loved our Titanic lecture. It's our longest single lecture in maple syrup history to date. It's like an hour and 30 some minutes. But I even said, I had all the facts, did a good job talking about the reactions. I couldn't explain like, you know, ship capacity knots on the water. Um, I don't understand meteorological facts other than to know the conditions are being set up for this kind of supercell system to emerge. Despite my ignorance, the benefit of being a historian and doing research is experts can provide the facts for you. So understand that the extra tropical cyclone that set the synoptic stage for the outbreak was centered over northwestern Montana on March 17th. When this whole thing gets underway, just picture in your mind a mental map right now. It's going to move out of our region here, whatever an extra tropical cyclone means, is going to move southeast out of Montana, work its way over the plains, and things will start getting bad, which I'll get to, I'm going to go fact by fact, when the tornado makes its way over Kansas. Remember, our, our tri-states are Missouri, Indiana, Illinois. Everyone knows where that's located on a U.S. map, I'm sure. I'm not going to edit this video later, popping up a map highlighting the states. I know states. I don't understand meteorology, but I'm good at states. And I think you are too. Now, in addition to this, remember, these conditions are kind of being set perfect for this this problem, to put it lightly, to emerge, a well-mixed early season continental tropical air mass existed over te West Texas and Northern New Mexico. To the east of this hot, dry air, buoyant maritime tropical air was coming out of the Gulf of Mexico. Simultaneously, a mid to upper level short wave trough likely approached from the Northwest coast of the US and moved rapidly through the persistent ridge, then digging southeastward across the Great Basin 
and central Rocky Mountains and emerging in the plains over Colorado. This initiated a, quote, Colorado low cyclogenesis. Anyone know what Colorado low cyclogenesis is? I have a tattoo, a CLC. It stands for Colorado low cyclogenesis. I'm all about this. Cyclogenesis sounds like the beginning of a cyclone. Cyclogenesis is the development or strengthening of cyclonic circulation in the atmosphere, right? So the beginning of this funnel cloud activity. Very good. <clears throat> the etymological investigation of words. Oh, Genesis, first book of the Torah, the Bible, the beginning plus cyclo. Right. The kind of very obvious answer is perfect. That was great deductive reasoning by you. Remember last semester we had a logic class, inductive versus deductive reasoning. No, that's, you're exactly right. Cyclogenesis is the development or strengthening of a cyclonic circulation in the atmosphere. Cyclogenesis is an umbrella term for at least three different processes, all of which result in development of some sort of cyclone. So number one, er, not, not applicable here. Remember, cyclogenesis, three, three um, storm patterns emerge. Number one, er, not us, tropical cyclones. They form due to latent heat, heat driven by significant thunderstorm activity, a warm core, tropical and cyclone over water. No, not us. Extra tropical cyclone also er, form as waves along weather fronts before uh, occluding later in their life cycle as cold core cyclones. What matters for us is this final characteristic, a mesocyclone form as war core, warm core, C-O-R-E. Mesocyclones form as warm core cyclones over land and can lead to tornado formation. Now, this cyclogenesis, Colorado low cyclogenesis, mesocyclone process, what does that mean? A Colorado low, remember the Colorado low is that which is forming in the Western United States. Long before we get to talking about the great tornado outbreak out of Kansas into Missouri, Indiana, and Illinois specifically, the tri-state tornado outbreak, which is the theme of today's class, you got to talk about this, this air mass. And I understand that. I am I'm so climatologically, meteorologically ignorant. I understand hot and cold air mixing together is a volatile form for storms. That's like, that is the tornado alley, Great Plains, Texas lightning storm stuff. When you have cold and hot fronts mixing together, they, they get explosive, right? It's very volatile. A Colorado low is a low pressure area that forms in southeastern Colorado or northeastern New Mexico, typically typically in the winter. After forming, the system moves across the Great Plains. I'm gonna continue reading, but just right there. This Colorado low is forming and you're gonna move into and eventually create in this cyclo cyclogenesis mesocyclone development cycle, create this aw awful storm mm -hmm. that we're gonna talk about today. After forming, the system moves across the Great Plains. Colorado lows can produce heavy winter precipitation and have a general east to northeast movement, impacting regions as far north as Winnipeg and as far east as the Atlantic coast. If upper level conditions are right, the jet stream can push the low farther south, bringing wintry precipitation as far as Texas. When pushed this far south, the system is often referred to as, quote, a blue norther. Winnipeg is in the Canadian province of what? Anyone know? Where is Winnipeg? They have a football team called the Blue Bombers in the CFL. It's, uh, Saskatchewan. it's not. Regina Regina is the capital of Saskatchewan. It's Manitoba. Alberta, two, two epic Alberta cities, Calgary, Stampeders, and Edmonton Elks. That's Alberta. Winnipeg is in Manitoba. Manitoba. It used to be called, and actually there's a petition being formed now, change it to Personatoba because it's sexy. <laughs> Manitoba. It's way too sexist for the Canadians. Do we have to? I'm just, is, is toxic masculinity funny to you guys? Manitoba is so misogynistic. It's going to be Personatoba. Winnipeg, Personatoba. On the more typical track, a Colorado low can be similar to an Alberta Clipper. Alberta. Maybe a nice word. Alberta. Remember, Edmonton and Calgary. Calgary is about eight hours from here. Edmonton about 11. <laughs> Uh, in the winter, Colorado lows are responsible for a majority of the snow the Midwest receives. Wow. I lived in Illinois for three years, got a ton of snow. Thank you, Colorado lows. Um, however, summer systems can trigger long-lasting convective systems, including severe weather. Spring and early summer Colorado low cyclogenesis can result in significant tornado outbreaks over the Great Plains and the Midwest.
Marie, welcome. We're talking about you're just coming in perfect time right now. Cyclogenesis, mesocyclones developing out of Montana into this Colorado low that I just read right now. It's going to make its way into our the star of our tragedy today, arguably the worst tornado outbreak in human history. Second most destructive on record, but maybe number one, because the, the first one is kind of disputed in Bangladesh, the 1925 tri-state tornado outbreak that affected Illinois, Indiana, and Missouri. Okay, so remember, March 17th through 19th, we're on, a, we're on a March 18th now. At 7 a.m. Central Time on March 18th, the low, the surface low pressure area moved to far northeastern Oklahoma while the warm front shot north into the circulation where the front then extended eastward. A maritime polar cold front draped southwestward across eastern Texas with a dry line forming directly to the south of the low. From southeastern Kansas to Kentucky and Indiana, early morning showers and thunderstorms north, north of the low and warm front cooled and stabilized the air, retarding northward advancement of the front and leading to a sharp contrast in temperatures north to south. Again, I am a climatological moron. I know sharp contrast of hot and cold temperatures in the same area is very, very volatile. And of course, this res resulted in unstable air, lower cloud bases, which is fav favorable to tornado genesis. Talked about cyclogenesis earlier. Tornado genesis is the exact same thing. The beginning stages, the formation of tornadic activity. By 2 p.m., the low was cent centered slightly south-southwest of St. Louis, Missouri. As the tri-state supercell neared the Mississippi River, other storms in the warm sector removed from the tri-state supercell were initiating around 3 p.m. Around 4 p.m., low central pressure moved and centered over south central Illinois as the supercell was moving um, into Indiana. By 6 p.m., the shortwave axis was over eastern Missouri. It was lifting northeast. At 7 p.m., the lowest place over Indianapolis, Indiana. With numerous thunderstorms east and south of the low and a squall line moving into the southeastern U.S., cold air out of action began behind the strong cold front fed into the cyclone as snow and sleet fell from eastern Iowa into central Michigan. Now, here are the confirmed tornadoes on March 18, 1925. Remember, when I'm talking about the tri-state tornado outbreak, I am talking about the big one of which I'm going to give the most detail forthcoming. There are bonkers amount of tornadoes. There I have page upon page of these Fujita ratings uh, color-coded of the strength of the tornadoes and what they did. So without further ado, remember this has started in Montana, Colorado, low cyclogenesis, in a tornado genesis over Kansas, now into our, into our target area. Tri-state means Illinois, Missouri, Indiana. Here are some tornadoes and just information about what happens. One, in uh, Montgomery County, Kansas, an F2 tornado. Wrecked a pair of barns in a filling station. Porches were torn loose from homes as well. This is F2. F2 is a joke on the, on the, on the Fujita scale. F5 is bad. I'm sorry. I don't find it funny. My porch was torn off my house, right? This is like, you know, oh, I got beat up by this guy. Um, yeah, but I mean, that was a tough fight. He beat me up. Yeah, that guy's like, that, the guy's like grandson. The grandfather, this is a different planet, and the grandfather's 20 feet taller, and he's gonna he's gonna destroy you. Terrible analogy. I'm like, <laughs> where are you going? Where are you going with this analogy? I was trying. But think of a better analogy. Um hmm. two high school football teams play, and then one team gets beat 45 0. And they're like, that was a tough game. And like that's that's the backup JV team. That you guys have to play the varsity tomorrow. <laughs> that's not even the JV. Like, so F2 is not a big deal. As tornado ratings go, it's still awful. Wrecking barns and tearing apart houses. It's awful at F2. Um, Shannon County, Missouri, a likely um, a likely separate member of a tri-state tornado family. Doesn't, doesn't register. It's just, you know, funneling through. Here we get to our first bad part, okay? Um, this F5, this F5 tornado. Is it the highest? F5 is the highest possible rating, 300 miles an hour winds. Wow. F5 then moves from Reynolds, Missouri into Iron, Missouri, Madison, Missouri, cities like Jackson and Franklin, Illinois, into Posey, Gibson, and Pike, Indiana. Causes today's money, $17 million of damage and 700 deaths. Okay. 
So the, the, this this part of the the of the twelve supercell, this is now getting to like this is this is the big one that I'll give them kind of more and more further detail on, right? Because remember, of the entire of the entire um, section of the entire whole conglomerate, there are seven hundred fifty one fatalities. The vast majority, ninety percent, come from this F five one that comes west northwest out of Ellington, Missouri. Will move through Murfreesboro, Illinois. And cause seventeen million dollars of damage on March eighteenth. This, the third one I'm listing now, is the number one overall one. Did you have any savings? Is it because there was some other thing happening in the world with the volcanic activity? No, no, exactly, no. Nothing is causing this. It's not like you know, uh, some volcano exploded in Chile, and no, this is just normal cyclogenesis. Okay. The temperatures are more warm than usual, uh, unseasonal, kind of in the this is March, late winter, early spring. It's just a normal tornado formation. Yeah. I'm not sure it's the same time period, but wasn't there like the dust bowl? It, that, like, I really, it? really love your question because if you've been keeping up with the syllabus, next week, a week from today, we cover the dust bowl. No, this is prior mm -hmm. to the dust bowl. The dust bowl is 1925. Excuse me, tri state tornado outbreaks today is 1925. Dust bowl is the 30s. So our next, next week, we have. Uh, on Wednesday, we do the Hindenburg disaster, and then next week is Dust Bowl and atomic bombs. Um, so that's a great guess. You would think the topsoil coming off, it has nothing to do with that either. All the more impressive, in the definition of impressive, like, wow, it's not propelled by some volcano or dust bowl. It's all on its own. It's, it's a normal tornado that is so, so devastating and awful. Um, this is the deadliest and longest track tornado in U.S. history. And please keep this town in mind. Remember, $17 million of damage, that's just a blip of the total $2.5 billion. So th this part, this F5, number three, uh, on March 18th is going to cause the most deaths, uh, God rest their souls. It's just a blip in the total property damage. Your earlier point, Barbara, about the rural nature of this. The whole Midwest gets like atomic bombed by this tri-state tornado event over the course of three days. It's, it's without any kind of facetiousness, being dead serious, and kind of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by nature over the course of um, three days. Hello, Maurizio. Hey, Russian. Um, the fourth tornado is an F4 from Mockport, Indiana, south to Louisville, Kentucky. It's an F4 tornado. Um, four deaths, a large, extremely violent tornado impacted 27 farmsteads in Indiana, many of which were leveled, the entire farmstead leveled. It levels, again, level, bomb language, boom, levels. Down nothing, a two block wide swath next to the Ohio River um, in this town uh, in, in Lakeland. 60 people were injured. Please note on the previous, um, when I was talking about the F5, Murfreesboro, Illinois, that town gets completely Nagasaki. That town gets 90% destroyed in nothing. It's been completely rebuilt. Um, tornado number five, an F2 in Colbert, Alabama. One death destroys a store filling station of pair of homes, 12 injuries. Next one, Buck Lodge, Tennessee, to Westmoreland, Tennessee, to Beaumont, Kentucky. An F4, 41 deaths, homes and churches leveled, 29 deaths occurred in Tennessee, eight of them in a single family, 50 other injuries. This tornado is still considered one of the most powerful in Middle Tennessee on record. This is a JV player, a backup to the F5 main one, and it's still one of the worst ones ever. This tornado family of these three days is, who here had heard about the tri-state tornadoes before today? You had heard about them, good for you. Most people have not. I would imagine it's one or two out of a hundred people, probably less. It's probably, you know, a quarter of a person out of a hundred, which means, you know what? Um, do people in tornadoes die because of, like, earthquakes, things fall on them? Yeah, I'd assume so. I assume a lot of it is like, I'm trying to take and the house collapses and stuff, yeah. Um, because of I'd assume so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think most people are not getting hit by the tornado head on. It's debris, a lot of debris coming so out of it. I don't know. Is, is that advice? I, right? find it depressed in the area. I think it's a depressed area. Yeah. If you lie flat, in the, lying flat on the ground is not going to help you. You're going to get picked up by a tornado and just eaten alive. I mean, like, but th that's why, like, if you, and has, has everyone seen the movie Twister, Kevin Costner? No. no, it's not Kevin Costner. It's Bill Paxton is the main guy from 1996. You've seen it? There's a scene like early in the movie where he like dives into a tornado shelter. Like you're supposed to go underground, mm -hmm. depressed area, and not stay on the ground. Um, I think a lot of, like you said, it's right. A lot of the death comes from 
uh, debris, funnel clouds, picking stuff up. Remember, F2s are strong enough to pick up cars and rip apart uh, porches. When you're talking about F4, F5s, you're talking about like bomb, like again, the city being inflated by bombs. I don't want to say, oh, this is so cool and interesting. God rest their souls. This is horrifying. I want to say this with the deepest respect, but it is so it is fascinating. Like the power of nature, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, Wait, I'm gonna interrupt you one more time. But Tanfra down in the coffee shop, the summer was traveling through Florida and saw funnel clouds in Florida. Yeah, yeah it's kind of I've that. Never seen it. That would be exceptional. Yeah, right. Uh, people have said tornado experts. I actually have a YouTube channel to suggest to you guys. Me and Dead Serious. If you think, oh, he's just going to tell us his YouTube channel, you guys should already be subscribed to that, obviously. Uh, Pecos Hank, this guy named Pecos Hank, Pecos spelled with the river, P-E-C-O-S. Pecos Hank is a Texas guy. He has, he has like millions of views, but he, he has beautiful photography. He's a tornado chaser, mm -hmm. um, a storm chaser. But what's cool is he goes out, and when I read, was reading today about psychogenesis, I heard his voice in my mind. He's a real strong uh, southern twang. He, he, I'll read it like Pecos Hank, ready? Um, this next one, um, F3, this tornado likely developed from the same storm as the mock per Louisville F4. At least 12 homes were destroyed, including, it talks about that. Mm -hmm. But not, it's, I mean, that, maybe it's not that hit. I don't know. We have a southern accent. But Pecos Hank is a, is a good YouTube channel to get like real, he has great photography, but also really good information. Um, maybe my accent was too absurd. So I'll read this again, normal voice. F3, Louisville into Jefferson, Oldham, Kentucky. Uh, three deaths, barns and structures destroyed. Another F3, Western Marion County to Lexington. Lexington, Kentucky is the home of, of UK, Kentucky Wildcats. Two deaths, many structures destroyed in Washington County. Rural farmhouses and barns demolished. 40 people injured. And the last significant one, this F3, Unionville, um, to northeast of Fosterville, talking about Bedford and Rutherford County in Tennessee. Four deaths, 10 homes destroyed, 15 people injured. So remember, now we're going to get to the star. We're going to talk about like, just the, the guy, the one tornado, the F5 tornado that, you know, 700 people died. But remember, in this family, this is so devastating. Over the course of a couple hours, three days, it is not really two days because the first day of cyclogenesis in the Colorado low, the storm system, the supercells out in the western part of the country by us, by Montana and Colorado. Now it finally gets to like the big deal. You ready? Remember, remember the, the town Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Yeah, and, see, yeah, that's, uh, and excuse me, Mur no, 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 Murfreesboro, um, Illinois. There, it, there is a Murfreesboro, okay. and I'm exactly like you. Like our minds are on the same wavelength. Murfreesboro, Tennessee is where Middle Tennessee State University is. And I've always heard Murfreesboro way more Tennessee. This is Murfreesboro. In fact, when I, when I, when I, Murfreesboro is the tragic city of this whole storm. It's so destroyed. I thought it was Tennessee too. It's not Tennessee. It is not Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The, we know it's the more famous one is Murfreesboro, Illinois. Okay. Main tornado. March 18, 1925. Begins at 12.45 p.m. and lasts until 4.30. Three hours and 45 minutes. It starts in Reynolds County, Missouri, and when it dissipates at 4.30, it is in Pike County, Indiana. While no photographs or film reels were taken or are known to exist, the tornado was frequently described by witnesses, quote, as an amorphous rolling fog, or, quote, boiling clouds in the ground and it fooled normally weather-wise farm owners who did not sense the danger until the storm was upon them mm -hmm. the condensation funnel was also reportedly sometimes wrapped in copious dust and debris debris which likely obscure, obscured it and made it less recognizable the parent supercell apparently transitioned to a high precipitation variety by the time it struck west frankfurt meaning the tornado was not readily vi visible as it approached as it was often shrouded in heavy rain and hail. You have this massive tornado behind it, this thick, fat, 300 miles per hour monster. Oh, it just looks, it's just hail and cloud. How terrifying is that? The very strong tornado and modern meteorologists estimate wind speeds over 300 miles an hour. At times exhibited an unusual appearance due partially to its size. At one point in Missouri, it was a full mile wide. Wow and the probable low cloud base of its parent thunderstorm. 
Yes, Brad. Does that 300 miles an hour include the hail? I assume so. If the, the if the funnel cloud is moving at 300 miles an hour, the hail spitting off that coming off 300 miles an hour. I, I'd assume so. I'd assume shockingly, awfully, a God of mercy. If you had a radar gun pointed at the funnel cloud and you were hail, you would be getting hail readings at 200, 300 miles an hour. I assume coming off. Yeah, especially considering the size, even golf ball or grapefruit sized hail being propelled by that kind of power source is going to be moving at that speed. The tornado is often accompanied by extreme downburst winds through the entirety of its course. The accompanying downburst periodically increase the width of the damage path from the overall average of three quarters of a mile up to three miles wide. This downburst effect takes a damaged path that's normally um, three quarters of a mile, makes it three miles wide. Imagine a three mile wide damage path, the Moscow Pullman Highway, that, that's from the, the, the Idaho border halfway to Pullman, just all over across. There has long been uncertainty as to whether the originally recognized reports of a 219 mile path represent one or kind of a you know tornado family. Modern meteorological theory regarding tornado and supercell morphology and dynamics suggests that a single tornado lasting for such a duration is highly improbable. It most likely was multiple tornadoes you know, being conglomerated, clustered um, into one event. On the other hand, meteorological analysis reveals no record of any ana analogous mesoscale circumstances in recent history, meaning that the weather conditions which led to the tri-state tornado were apparently unique. It is a once in a human history type event. And I will confess myself, I didn't think coming into this class, this might be one of the most exciting lectures, but it, it's we're talking about something that is arguably the worst tornado in human history and one of the most unique ones and one of the most meteorologically kind of like fingerprint, like one of a kind, crazy. No single factor accounts for the exceptional path length and duration, though the fast forward motion of the tornado, which averaged almost 60 miles an hour, may have translated to more distance covered. So let's just, before we talk about what happens now on the ground, tornado is a mile wide. You can't see it. It's moving at 300 miles an hour, spitting 300 mile an hour hail, and it's moving 60 miles an hour. This is an absolute monster scenario. Like, God have mercy, when we compare this to the atomic bombs, if a, a rogue state, if an army could weaponize this, they would. Let's not use a bomb. Let's release a mile-wide 300-mile tornado. That's way more effective to like destroy an entire city. This is unbelievable how powerful Mother Nature is. The tornado was first sighted as a highly visible and relatively small condensation funnel in the rugged forested hills of Shannon County, Missouri, about 1240. Remember, it's going to last for three hours, 45 minutes until dissipation. However, this was likely a separate member of the tornado family, and the main member likely began in Reynolds County. So people are getting like hyped up seeing this, you know, in this. And by the way, the the daily report for that day, the weather report going into that day was uh there would be wind events. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about the ultimate understatement, you know, the worst tornado in human history. But what I'm saying is people, they're already. It was not like clear sky, go to the beach. It was, it's going to be windy. We I often check weather.com, like Pullman weather, it says, you know, 30 mile an hour wind. People were aware, if you're a farmer, 30 mile an hour wind speed, we got to, I don't know, batten some stuff down around the farm, whatever. Uh, people already like looking for, you know, curious weather, dangerous weather. Obviously, it's nothing like it'll come. But they think, oh, it might be this. Well, no, maybe it's Reynolds County. The first fatality occurs around one o'clock when a farmer was caught off guard north northwest of Ellington. Uh, yeah, remember these farmers? Uh, you know, kind of the whole thing with the Galveston earthquake we talked about. We're going to do electronic hurricane Katrina near semesters end. I've been through hurricanes before. I've seen tornadoes. This is not the one, right? Um, in Bollinger County, thirty-two children were injured when two schools were damaged. Multiple homes and farms were completely destroyed near Licksville. A farmer and two children killed. Altogether, at least 12 people died and 200 were injured in Missouri. The tornado then crosses the Mississippi River into southern Illinois, debarking trees. Debarking trees is just, that's a great statement. It's ripping the bark off of trees. Okay, and th that takes a lot of power to debark a tree. And deeply scouring the ground in rural areas, your whole point. Thank God a lot of this is, in, this is not in New York City or something. Scouring the ground in a rural area from hitting the town of Gorham at 2.30 p.m., essentially obliterating the entire town. 
Almost every structure in Gordon, Illinois was leveled or swept away and railroad tracks were reportedly ripped out of the ground. More than half the town's population was injured or killed, 30 from the immediate storm, 170 injured, six die later. Continuing to the Northeast at an average speed of 62 miles an hour, up to 75 miles an hour in bursts, 300 miles an hour spinning in a circle, tornado style, moving a car on cruise control at 75 miles an hour. The tornado cuts a wide swath over a mile wide in the city of Murfreesboro, a thriving coal shipping center railroad town of 10,000 people. The tornado levels everything except the extreme southeastern side of the town. Murfreesboro, Illinois, like Gorham, Illinois, has a nuclear bomb dropped on it. I can't put it any other way. Like it's the exact same level of destruction. What's the, I mean, it's a serious question. What's the only benefit to having a town destroyed by a tornado, not a nuclear bomb? Serious question. No radiation fall. It's exactly it. No, no, that's, the, that's exactly it. There's no radiation poisoning afterwards. Otherwise, it's the exact same thing in terms of destruction. Okay, can I ask you a question? The, Go ahead. Science, the science of it, Mr. Geisley. So the tornado comes down. I'm assuming the 300 mile an hour winds are coming at the tornado from opposing sides, causing the funnel. Inside the funnel is like a giant suction, is what I'm assuming. I'm the wrong person to ask about the science. I, I, I promise, I promise always, you know, like in this class, it's, it's a kind of thoroughgoing rule of mine. But I'll never give you false information. And the hope with, with that is that when I tell you stuff, you always take my word as, as gold. You know, like I, I tell you what's true. I don't know. I have no idea. I encourage you. I'm dead serious. Read. Of course, you can find this information online, like a science of a tornado. But go look at Peiko, Peiko's Hank's channel. Peiko's Hank is not my cousin or my brother or my, my bro. I'm here to promote his channel. He's great. Peiko's Hank is super cool because he has great photography it's very cool and interesting stuff but he also gives you all the science i have no idea how it works that sounds right it sounds like the tornado is sucking 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 there's this kind of like you know interior massive wind funnel that lifts things up and into it and then but you know how, exactly how, how how is a 300 mile an hour interior speed relative to the 75 mile an hour point i don't i have no idea i have no idea how it's the speed inside because i think things so I think inside the funnel there is like the eye of a hurricane. Okay, maybe there's some well, maybe there's some comments, but but this is 300 miles an hour. I know that the, the speed of the whipping of the funnel is 300 miles an hour. So a, a person, imagine like I'm sorry for laughing. I'm laughing is just like this so absurd to think about. Imagine a person getting picked up in the middle of that eye of the hurricane. Right. They get dropped and then they get hit by 300 miles an hour. They get just completely destroyed. I mean like. It's not like, oh, I can just I, I can just run alongside this at that, you know, it's moving, it's just it's an absolute disaster. I do not know how the science works. That is a, is a great question. I do not want to give you information. All I know is the wind speed of the funnel is moving over 300 miles an hour, it's spinning hail at the same speed. And the the, the, the progress, remember it's, it's 300 miles an hour, it's a mile wide. The progress across open land is the speed of a car on a highway. Yeah, 60 average, up to 73, 75. So remember, in Murfreesboro, all of this town, 10,000 people, that's, you know, what, um, half of Moscow, right? Yeah. That's, not a, that's, that's more than, a lot more than Colfax, like five times Colfax's population today. The tornado levels all but the extreme southeastern side of the town, where many densely populated working class neighborhoods saw you know, some of this complete kind of destruction. Entire rows of homes levels swept away. Many other structures damaged or destroyed, including the MNO Railroad shop, where 35 people were killed, schools in the area destroyed. After the tornado passed, Murfreesboro, Illinois, large fires ignited and swept through the rubble, burning many of the trapped survivors alive. In all, 18, 188 people died in the immediate store in Murfreesboro, including at least 20 who were never identified. The official number of injured was a staggering 623, while some sources claim higher, perhaps over 700 people. Um, of those injured, 46 more later died. It, once more, for all eternity, oh Lord Jesus Christ, God rest their souls. Bringing the storm's death toll in Murfreesboro to 234. To date, it is the highest exactly by tornado of any single city in the U.S. To this day, Murfreesboro, Illinois, suffered the worst tornado death rate, not rate, just death number of any city ever. And I'm going to talk to you today about the Joplin tornado of 2011 an F5 tornado that happened in all of our lifetimes, very recently, 2011. Murfreesboro is still number one. The tornado then strikes the farming town of DeSoto, Illinois, on a scale paralleling Gorham, is completely obliterated. 
That's three towns down the road. Gorham, Murfreesboro, and DeSoto, Illinois, completely just nuclear bomb. 56 people killed in the Midian storm, another 105 injured, five who lied, uh, later died. 33 of the deaths were students that were killed in the partial collapse of DeSoto School, where your point. The worst tornadic death toll in a single school in U.S. history. So this tornado has all these awful, awful, horrible records. Also killed in DeSoto is Jackson County Deputy uh, Sheriff George Bolin. While on patrol when the storm struck, the tornado lifted him from the ground and he disappeared into the funnel. His body was never found. Let me read that again. May God rest his soul. And if this guy is in heaven, you know, St. George, please pray for us. This is horrifying. George Bolin, Jackson County Deputy Sheriff, while on patrol, when the storm struck, storm struck, while on patrol, when the storm struck, the tornado lifts Deputy Sheriff George Bowen from the ground, and people see him disappear into the funnel cloud, and his body is never found. Uh, is it projectile sent somewhere miles away? Is it is he incinerated in a certain sense? And again, incineration is literally you know burned by fire, but I'm using that word purposely. Is he ripped apart? May God rest his soul. Near near end the um, near the end of this whole train. Remember, it dissipates at four thirty. The tornado roars into a large factory town of Princeton, destroying much of the southern side of the town, killing thirty eight, injuring one hundred fifty two. Large sections of Princeton were, as once more, um, completely leveled. In Indiana, at least ninety five people died. So, what's the aftermath? In the immediate aftermath, hospitals from St. Louis, of course, Missouri, the St. Louis, the famous large St. Louis, hospitals from St. Louis to Evansville, Illinois, were inundated with injured and dying as the storm injured, as we said earlier, more than 2,000 people. In Missouri, relief trains carried the most seriously injured north to St. Louis, while the remainder were sent to hospitals at Perry, Perryville and Cape Girardeau. At Gorham, remember, the town was completely destroyed, right? The Missouri Pacific Railroad uh, shuttled most of the injured north to East St. Louis and the remainder south to Cairo, Illinois. The town hospital in Murfreesboro, this town that was 90% eliminated, right? Where several hundred were injured was ill-equipped to deal with the casualties. God bless them. You know, you think? And, you know, 2,000 people in the town itself, right? Prompting hundreds to be shipped out of the other towns by train once the lines were cleared. The most seriously injured were sent by train to Barnes Hospital in St. Louis. Keep that in your back pocket. Barnes Hospital in St. Louis. Talk about the reaction. In addition to the dead and injured, thousands were left without shelter or food. Fires erupted, leading to conflagrations in some places, which, of course, exacerbated the damage. Looting and theft, notably of the property of the dead, was reported. Sadly. Once more, a reaction, right? Just like Black Plague, all these disasters. What would I say is 95% of the reaction to these disasters? Heroism. Holy men and women, by the grace of God, helping their brothers and sisters, saintly stuff. There's 5% of this stuff. I'm going to take some dead guys watch. Evil, evil, disgusting. I'm going to break the commandment, thou shalt not steal, and add it, like desecration of the dead by stealing a dead guy's property. There's that, that is going on as well. Recovery was generally slow with the event uh, leaving a lasting blow to the region. Again, do you think? Do you think it would leave a lasting blow to the region on the Palouse if all if Colfax, Uniontown, Moscow, Pullman, and a Colton were completely destroyed by a tornado? I think that would leave lasting damage if all of WSU and UVI was leveled by a tornado, probably. And again, of course, I'm being sarcastic. I don't mean to be flippant. It's just a serious topic. But like that's a huge understatement that it left lasting damage. Of course it did. Let's talk about some reactions. Today might be the most uh, non-Catholic reactions I have for you. And the reason for that is I scoured far and wide for um, like statements by bishops, the Archbishop of St. Louis, couldn't find anything indirect to this. What I love though, let me get theological for a second is, you know, who did Jesus Christ die for, right? Everyone. Christ is the savior of all people. What does Catholicism mean? Universal. Anyone who lives that law and the prophets, Matthew 22, 36 through 40, to love God above all and love your neighbors yourself is being Catholic. To be Catholic is just to restore that, you know, God in the garden before Adam and Eve do their thing and screw us all up. You know, there, there are no separate religions, whatever. There's one truth rooted in God. And then we fall apart, you know, and can I do salvation history in a minute? You know, probably, I don't know if I can, but 
you know, we're kicked out of the garden. God chooses, chooses the Jews to be the chosen people from which will come the Messiah. And uh, all this death and destruction is supposed to be and is, right, on the cross, brought back to its original organic wholeness. And in the Catholic Church, the fulfillment of Israel in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, everyone is equal, right? As John the Baptist says to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers. No, don't say to yourself you have special DNA. God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. So in this reaction, anyone who's loving their neighbors himself is being a Catholic. I will argue, you know, any good stuff, Christ himself says, whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters did, for, did to me. That's what I'm going to talk about with Barnes Hospital in a second. There's this guy who's not a Catholic. I believe he's Episcopalian or Presbyterian. He creates this hospital that eventually helps these people. What a holy guy. Oh, but he's not Catholic. Okay. Well, oh, this we don't have anything to do with the Samaritans. No. Today's going to be our most kind of non-directly Catholic. Like with 9-11 or Chernobyl, stuff from the popes. Um, last class, extraordinarily on-the-nose Catholic reaction. Blessed Emperor Carl, Pope Pius X. Today it's more kind of just the universal being of Catholicism. First reaction from people who actually lived through this. This is from the Herald Times in Bloomington, Indiana. The article, I believe, is from 2004. So these women are already very, very, um, you know, old at this point. This was happening in 1925. These are women like in their, you know, mid-80s or 90, looking back on their little girls having survived this event. Juanita Hyatt remembers huddling in her family's living room with her three sisters and mother as the deadliest tornado in U.S. history roared overhead. When it subsided, they were left standing on their living room floor, but the walls around them were rubble. I said, mother, it's like the world has come to an end. Hyatt, 84, recall, so 84 in 2004, she was born in 1920. She was a five-year-old girl mm -hmm. when this happened. Hyatt, 84, recalled Friday before a ceremony dedicating a marker in honor of a tornado that swept through Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, um, killing 689 people. Hyatt's brother Virgil was among 52 Griffin residents killed. Nearly every structure in the town, 35 miles west of Evansville, was flattened. Some who survived remained. Others grieved for the dead and lived in fear of storms for the rest of their lives. I can't imagine the, the understatement of that. Mm -hmm. Do you think if like, I thought it was just hail and whatever, I'm gonna find it was a, was a mile long, 300 mile funnel cloud monster. Do you think you'd be worried every time the meteorologist comes and says, hey, uh, strong storms might be passing through uh, Whitman County on Friday. Do you think it might give you a little bit of a shudder? Again, talk about PTSD, right? Nearly 100 people, including about 10 survivors, watched Friday as high and two of her surviving sisters unveiled the black marker in a solemn ceremony. I think it's wonderful said Ellen Nottingham, 90, of Evansville. She should have been, you know, like 10, 11 then. They've waited a long time. Nottingham said seven children and a driver of a school bus were killed in front of her house. Her nine-year-old sister and 15-year-old brother also died. My brother said, that's some cloud, and then <laughs> ran out of the door, end quote. That was the last time she talked to him. I mean, yeah, like, you know, go out and see it. Like, he, maybe he was like that, that poor guy who was swept up into the funnel cloud. Um, after the tornado, heavy rains caused the Wabash River to flood. Within a week, Griffin was accessible only by boat or railroad, which was how many of the bodies were transported out to some of these, you know, hospitals in the area. The town had 500 residents at the time of the tornado and was thriving due to a regional oil boom. A schoolhouse, church, and grain elevator were rebuilt, but the town never fully recovered. Today, Griffin has 160 residents. There's only one gas station, one restaurant. The high school closed. In 1959, and the gymnasium is used as a community center. Quote, we never did come back, Hyatt said. There was nothing left to make a living with. There were too many memories and no place to stay. Mm -hmm. End quote. Wow. The marker from the Indiana Historical Bureau was paid for with $1,700 collected by townspeople and former residents. Ola Bell Straw, 77 and Griffin, said residents decided to get the marker because they feared the tornado would be forgotten. We thought if we don't do something, this generation will die and no one will remember. The marker is placed across the road from the store where several people took refuge in the basement, including Hyatt's 10-year-old brother. A brass plaque with the names of those killed will soon be placed near the historic marker. The tornado started in Ellington, Missouri, moved through Illinois, and eventually Indiana in its 219-mile path. This is obviously a rehash of the material we just cover now, but it's worth hearing again. The hardest hit town was Murfreesboro, Illinois where 234 people were killed. At least 71 people died in Indiana. Others were killed in Owensville and Princeton. Lucian Hyatt, the for Princeton, who was not related to Juanita, was five when the tornado hit, blowing out the windows in his farmhouse. His father was killed in town. 
His grandfather helped his mother raise him and his three siblings. His mother and many other residents remi- remained terrified of the storms. Every time a little cloud came up, they start to worry. I know my mother was scared to death. Again, yeah, you shaking your head is exactly how I feel. Exactly. All right. So second reaction. Second reaction is um, about this guy, Robert Augustus Barnes. He's listed it's on a general biography online, Robert Augustus Barnes, 1808 to 1892, as a, quote, self-made businessman in the St. Louis area. He is best known for his donation, which helped found what is today called the Barnes Hyphen Jewish Hospital. In 1996, the Barnes Hospital merged with the Jewish Hospital. Today it's called Barnes Jewish Hospital. Um, G.K. Chesterton was pretty hard on philanthropy. And he's like, philanthropists often love mankind, but not men. Oh, I love humanity, but I hate Maurizio. Oh, I love humanity, but I hate Groshin. Groshin, I hate Groshin for Chesterton. He's the worst. I love mankind, but Groshin is awful. I hate Groshin. Like that kind of attitude, right? Okay, and philanthropists often will donate money to get tax breaks or blah, blah, blah. Criticize philanthropists. Let's give Robert Barnes, I hope St. Robert Barnes, all props and credit. Barnes is a guy who works for a bank for a long time, makes tons of money, and um, he has no kids. He has no project. And he decides, I'm going to find found a hospital. Upon his death at the age of 83 in 1892, this is, what, 33 years before the tornado, he left a portion of his wealth to build a hospital in his name to provide medical care for the sick and injured without distinction of creed. How beautiful and Catholic. I don't know what he was. Secular, I'm guessing he's a Presbyterian. I just guessed that. <laughs> some some like lost, you know, version, Protestant version. I don't know. How Catholic, how beautiful, how love of Christ, love of neighbor, you know, fulfilling the law perfectly. And maybe that's his salvation. Maybe Barnes died and he goes straight to heaven. And in Saint in Saint Peter's like, you know, welcome to heaven. He's like, how do I get to heaven? Because he's like, now I see Catholicism is true. Maybe he wasn't a Catholic. I got to go to purgatory, right? He's like, they're going straight to heaven because you have your hospital and tornado. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, and St. Peter starts laughing. Offers him a beer first. He's like, let's drink this before you enter into heaven. Because inside heaven, it's even better stuff. The eye is not seen, ear is not heard. But we can have this beer right here at the gates of heaven. And he's like, there's no time here. Isn't that hilarious? Uh, this tornado that's going to strike 33 years, you building this hospital, having the infrastructure in place saves a bunch of lives. A bunch of lives, when they're evacuated out of St. Louis, they go to Barnes Hospital. So Barnes himself, this guy with no children, has, let's say, maybe scores, 40, 60, 80 spiritual children who, whose lives he saved. And who knows who some of the people were, went on to become whatever. Maybe some of that, some of that person, a great-grandmother alive now, her son's become, her grandson's become president in the next 100 years. Like weird stitches known to God alone. But Barnes, by doing this act of true charity, you know, beautiful philanthropy, God bless him, save all his lives. Last reaction, we had people at the time, Barnes, here's the most Catholic reaction, but the reason I said it wasn't, today's class is from Joplin, Missouri, who doesn't really count, right? Um, because it's from 2011. But and by, by the way, last point on Barnes, there's a, anyone know the, the YouTube channel, Census Fidelium? Anyone ever watch that channel? Census Fidelium posts really beautiful homilies from priests often. There's a, a, rec- a good episode recently on entitled this, God or Mammon, riches aren't evil if you are detached and use them for good. God or mammon, riches aren't evil if you are detached and use them for good. You can be a poor person and be holy. You can be a poor person and be evil. You can be rich and holy, rich or evil. I think the reason our, our blessed Lord and Savior says, you know, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than a rich man to enter heaven is if you're rich, you're like, oh, I don't need God. I'm just going to buy a bunch of yachts, party, like do awful stuff. I wish that Mother Teresa had received billions of dollars in foundations. Mother Angelica famously uh, I was looking for like oligarchs to sponsor EWTN. I don't know if you know this story, but Mother Angelica, and remember, she was like this awesome Italian girl, you know, with like no filter, right? And uh, Mother Angelica, I think one time, like goes in adoration to God. And she's like, that's how she told the story. Maybe she's saying the fish was this big. Maybe she's embellishing. I don't know. But Mother Angelica says, uh, you know, Lord, I need you to help me. Basically, like, like begging God and kind of like Old Testament style, prophet style, you know, why, Lord? Why why are we in the desert? Lord, you wanted me to do EWTN. I need money. I need it now. We're going to go under. She gets a call like 10 minutes later and it's this rich guy on a boat and he's like, I just had an inspiration that I need to send you a bunch of money. 
And she doesn't, she doesn't even let him finish. She's like, why are you? It's like that. <laughs> so it's like, that is awesome. That is, that is so cool. Barnes, God bless Robert Barnes. Oh, he's this scumbag 1%. No, he's an awesome guy. Maybe Barnes is in a high place in heaven because he has, he uses money as a banker and businessman to get a bunch of money to build a hospital that helped a lot of people and that helped a lot of people in their time of great need. Here's a rich guy who is poor in spirit, as the Beatitude says, right? Great things attached. Yeah, exactly. The riches are evil if you're attached to them, right? If you're right. detached from them. I, I hope detached holy people have billions of dollars so they can end poverty and give to the church and all that kind of stuff. The problem is attachment. Um, Joplin, Missouri tornado. Costliest in U.S. history. This one, Tri-State, was $2.55 billion. Joplin, Missouri, $3.64 billion of damage. May 22nd, 2011. All of us were alive then. 46 um, minutes, it lasts. 158 dead. 1.1 thousand injured. Here's a Catholic reaction to uh, the Joplin, Missouri tornado. A beautiful moment of God kind of piercing through that he's with us all the time, perhaps you can say. Um, and I want you to keep this in mind when we talk about Hiroshima. Do you guys know in the whole total destruction era of Hiroshima, there's these Jesuits in this house that totally survived? Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about them. And they attribute it to living the message of Fatima. Like the bomb drops on their head, basically, and nothing happens to them. And doctors later say, well, you guys are screwed, though. I mean, like you survive, but you're going to get all this. They never get sick, nothing. They're like, you attribute it to praying the rosary daily. Yeah, dead serious. Wow. Father H Herbert or Hubert Schiffer, I'll have the exact name, the full story come in two weeks. One of these cities where the bomb was dropped. There's also one in, I only heard one. There's also another one too. Really? Oh, cool. Good. So, our, so, so our cult, and I know like Nagasaki to this day is still like the most Catholic Japanese city or one of them. Oh. Um, in case you didn't know that. Now you do. Uh, Joplin, Missouri, last reaction of today. 2011 Joplin tornado flattened houses, tore through businesses, tore tossed around countless cars and trees. There, Then there were the churches, including more than two dozen that passed the storm. One includes St. Mary's Catholic Church and school and the cross that still stands today. We heard through a grapevine the school and the church had really taken a hit, but we walked up there and saw, and we walked up there and saw the total devastation. It was very overwhelming. It was so overwhelming to see uh, the destruction. Uh, just the things uh, we did as a parish family at the moment walking through, just seeing the debris kind of put a thought in your head, will it ever come back again? Is this truly the end? Joplin 2011, same thing like Tristate, right? Clearing up the wreckage of the school uh, was not something they had to do on their own. I think the greatest blessing that came out of the tornado was the number of people from all around the world that came to help. Um, people are coming in. Of course, this, thank God, the age of the internet kind of GoFundMe campaigns. I don't know if they're actually using GoFundMe in 2011, but like that kind of idea of crowdsourcing, just, hey, it's on Facebook, whatever, come help these people. What's cool out of this whole thing, though, as I finish, in the midst of everything destroyed, the cross remained totally intact and standing. Wow. And so I think talked about, too, they had a statue of Our Lady in their house. It was not damaged at all. Like everything was completely crushed, and they had a statue of Mary that was like, you know, just completely untouched, not even, not even a you know, scar, a smudge, anything. Didn't that, something like that happen with the Notre Dame choir? That, yeah, there's all yes. there's always these kind of stories. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's like, you know, to the atheists, and I, I want to entitle this love letter to the atheists. God bless the atheists. May they receive the grace to not be atheists anymore. I have forever been changed by what St. Therese of Lizzo, little flower once said. She said that God allowed her to be an atheist for a day. Like he took away the grace of her faith and she's like, I totally got it. She's like, I looked at them differently. It was like all these stupid people, why don't they believe in God? To believe in God is a grace, right? If you think like, I've always believed in God. Of course I believe in God. It's so dumb not to believe in God. That's the grace of God. Some people are just like, I can't, why? Do I, I don't have, I don't, I don't believe kind of thing. So may, may God give the people the grace, you know, to believe. Maybe those moments are for those atheists. Maybe that seeps through someone's hard heart. Like, wow, why is that? Why in this disaster is this cross still standing? Is that a coincidence? How how can these guys not get blown up? These Jesuit guys. This is amazing. They, the bomb fell on their head. Why are they alive? Okay. Well, if there is a God, God have mercy. Kind of first, you know, atheist prayer. Help me, God. You know, very beautiful, right? So, anyways, uh, that's it. That's all I have for you today. Thank you all for coming. We have, I've said in the last couple of streams, you know, 
I think we've had most, and I said, you know, you don't see the flock note I sent out last week. I sent out a flock note. I was like, you know, thank you all, largest attendance ever. It's true. Like this semester, going back to 2019, we've had the most people in this class. Individual people who've come. Like we've had like 41 individual people, including like Hunter, who's here in the first few classes. Now he's in Gonzaga. People come and go. But um, although we've had the most people ever, a lot of our classes have recently been thin. And I was actually thinking coming in today, oh, you know, it's midterm week. I wonder if anyone will be here. That's fine. I'll still make the video and put it online. But having, you know, six people here is that's great. It's awesome. And, uh, you know, people are always welcome. And uh, to say, like, oh, invite your friends. It's like, well, of course, I understand people who can't come because it's in the middle of a work day. I have exams. I can't credit. There's a million reasons not to come. At the same time, I never want a prohibitive factor for someone not to come is because they think, well, I haven't come before. I can't just show up. Yes, you can. If that, if someone is, I can't come because I'm working, they can't come. I can't come because I have an exam. They can't come. There's a million reasons that are legit. It is not a legitimate reason if one of your friends says, hey, this class sounds interesting. I'd actually love to hear it. I've never heard anything about Chernobyl, but I can't just show up, right? Yes, you can, right? Every class is an individual episode. So if someone's interested, if they're worried that that I'm going to be angry somehow, I know I have this reputation. I'm just so angry and mean. Um, <laughs> if someone's worried that like, you know, I'm not going to have let them be in the class. Anyone come for any episode, but it's really, I mean, it's so awesome seeing all of you here. So thank you. God bless you. Um, until Wednesday. Can See I, you later. Wait, can I go get, so we have a little time to so tangential points that you raised? Oh yeah, go, go for it. Okay, so one was the, they love mankind and they hate people. I think it's something we're thinking about because I used this phrase in my life with my friends and family. Because I hate my hands. Uh, yeah, you're the opposite. <laughs> so in general, I'm like, oh, people are so stupid. I think that they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> There's not a person that I'm not. I agree. I agree. But in general, I think, you know, as, as humanity, it's, it's not a very silver suit in there. Um, so I think it is worth thinking about. And I think Flynn would be is good regardless of the motivations. You know, like maybe you don't get saved with me if the wrong motivations, but we need to land with you in this world. If we do land with you, we trouble. No, I agree. And, uh, but, I, I, so, but I would disagree with maybe you don't get saved. I think the worst scumbag guy who's a complete scumbag, who uses his riches just for like crazy parties with um, women of ill repute and illegal substances and everything bad, like just terrible, awful stuff. What if that guy dies and then he's like, he, here, he's assigned to purgatory. And the guy's like, I thought, you know, I didn't believe in God, but I definitely thought if this is real, I'm going to hell. And like St. Peter's like, no, like you gave money to a hospital. And that's why you're going to, you're going to get your bucket in purgatory, brother. Like you lived an awful life and you got to pay for that, but you're not damned. Like that, I think it does, of course, like anything. I wonder often, you know, like someone once said on the census fidelium channel that like um, some guy, I don't know how it was revealed to him, but it was like he it was revealed to him that like his friend or someone was saved. And the guy was like shocked. He's like, my friend was awful. And the guy was just, you know, a womanizer, cheated at business, everything bad. But it was kind of revealed that like he prayed one Hail Mary a day. <laughs> like he had maintained the beautiful habit. His mother was like, please just, okay, you're not going to mass, all this stuff. I mean, please come back. But if you're in between doing your drugs and whatever, can you just please promise me one, just say one Hail Mary day. And it was revealed to me like that, that was his salvation. That, that, that gave him the grace that at the time of his death, our lady, you know, in, interceded for him and got the grace of God to give him saying, you know, Lord have mercy and whatever. So, you know, I think everything counts. I'm very much, I'm an incurable optimist like that way. I think the worst person ever, one act of true goodness might in the end, at least, you know, they may have to, that's why I love the doctrine of purgatory so much too. Yeah, if you live life totally anti-God and hating man, you don't just go straight to heaven. Everyone goes to heaven. But if you did some good things, you know, can you, do you have hope? If you turn to God at the end, of course, you know, God will forgive you. So I think I agree with you that we need plan to be whatever the motivation is. I just think also to not leave the class on just bashing Chesterton. You all know how much I really do, like most counts. I really like Chesterton a lot. I really do. I love Chesterton. But I think he does have a point that often these guys are just like, they'll do philanthropy just so I wanted my name on a plaque, like I'm number one donor. It's not out of love for Barb. Barb came to me and said, hey, you're a billionaire. Can you donate to my cause? I hate her cause. I hate her. I hate everyone. I just want I just want her to like give me a benefit dinner with how great I am. Like that's the wrong motivation. And yet it's still good if I do that because it's helping this brick. Dedicated brick. Yeah. It's still easier to give. Like God bless the people who go and get their hands dirty, which is something I never do, right? Go and help clean up the rubble, help bury the dead. 
so much easier for someone like me to write a check. And good, people need you. People need people to write checks. People need that. It's all needed, exactly. I know. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, but there is a difference between each Chesterton's life between loving me and kind of loving me. Right. I, I'm just going fixating on that. My second is the, the reactions of humans. So the first is the King of Osama says, "Cool cloud and dies." Okay. I do think this is a human reaction. Totally. I'm in my house in Chicago, not a safe city, right? Helicopters over overhead, right? I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick my head out, yeah. I go out to see the TV and it's like the up and we're like, oh no, this is stupid. If there are helicopters, they're searching for someone. Go inside, lock the door, and get 911 on speed. Truly, out. truly, because God, truly, God forbid, if there's a mushroom cloud on the horizon, though. Who would not go out? I'd go outside. I'm not gonna like, oh, take cover. Like, no, what's going on? I, yeah. I, I'd be outside the entire time. Like until it was like, oh, unless it's coming towards I wanna like what's going on? Like curiosity killed the cat is a cliche for a reason. Like we're curious beings. So that's the second part. Yeah. Satisfaction brought it back. It's what? Satisfaction Curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. <laughs> that sounds like a rap. That sounds like a rap song. <laughs> like no, in a rap song, you could build a bar like you know, curiosity killed the cat, like sick beat, sick beat, curiosity killed the cat. And the whole thing is building it up, right? And he's talking about how he's like a big, he's a bad boy, but then he like repents in the song, he's like satisfaction brought it back. And you have like back, 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 end of song. Cause that's legit. Thanks, Damien. I I didn't I didn't know that was the same. It's awesome. Yeah, again, curious about it.